Accounting firms are picking up ChatGPT in record numbers right now. But if you do tax work, it can be super powerful, but you can also do it completely wrong in a way that'll make the AI hallucinate and it, it, it could trick you. So today we're going through the do's and the don'ts of using ChatGPT for tax research, because it's gotten a whole lot better in the last couple of months. Let's jump right in. Number one, do use the team's plan. There's a, there's a whole bunch of different flavors of ChatGPT now. Use the team plan for two reasons. Uh, they will never train on your data, that is the prompts that you put in, the documents that you put in. They don't then use that to train their models. But number two, it actually comes with AICPA SOC 2 Type 2 security. The other plans don't. Even the pro plan, nerds, big time nerds out there, the $200 a month plan that comes with some other cool stuff doesn't come with the same data protections. Just look out for that. So pick up the team plan. That's the one for you. Number two, don't log into the same chat GPT account on your phone. Most firms don't have like security policies on their phones. You need to, it needs to be the same bar as you use on your computer. If you have like email that's accessible on your phone, it's got all sorts of uh, potentially secure stuff in there, right? So unless your phone is locked down, don't put the same chat GPT account on your phone where you could potentially be working with sensitive data. Number three, do use O3 mini Hi, take a look. Always gotta look out for what model you're talking to. And so up at the top here, you select the model you're gonna use. By default, it's gonna choose GPT-40. Right now, GPT-40, for accountants, you're probably only gonna use 40 for like creative things, like help me write this thing. Make this email less salty. Give me band name ideas. But for anything technical, you wanna come down here to O3 Mini High. When it came out about a month ago, it was the lowest hallucination rate model of all time. Now I got a couple Google models that beat it just barely. But for reference, on this benchmark, the hallucination rate is 0.8%. That's down from 1.7% for 40. So it literally cuts the risk of hallucinations in half. The main difference is it will think about a problem. Rather than just blurting out a response immediately, it has this internal dialogue, which is actually really interesting because you can see it play out. So if a bear and 110 pound accountant got into a street brawl, but the accountant was a champion wrestler, who would win? Complex question, right? A lot of levels to it. It's a 110 pound accountant, but it's, it's a wrestler, so it can handle itself. The model here, it reasoned for only eight seconds, but it shows all the logic. It's asking about this hypothetical scenario. The accountant is a champion wrestler, which is an interesting twist. In reality, a bear is so much physically stronger, but even with the wrestler's skills, it would be overwhelmed. The bear will likely win. It's actually really interesting. The next time you throw a technical question at this model, I super recommend like skimming through that because this logic is like the exact same logic that you would uh, train a staff member to use when thinking through a technical problem. So you have all the thinking up here and then it comes down to a solution. There's a little toggle right here if you don't wanna see the thinking. But here's the thing, here's why this is the wrong way to do research. Because number four, you don't want to rely on the model's training data. So this model, it just answered the question according to what it knows about bears and 110 pound accountants. That is a product of the data that it was trained on. But if you're thinking about technical tax stuff, what it's trained on is gonna be a mishmash of all sorts of different years and, and uh, agencies rules. It's not as targeted as we need it to be. So a big thing to look out for is anytime you're gonna throw it, say a question about deductibility of home office, my client uses part of their bedroom for work, can they deduct it? Enable search the web, then rather than falling back on just what it knows, it'll actually go out and try to find something um, more up to date. So it gives us an answer here and it references irs.gov, but it also references gasp, H&R block, yuck. Get that out of here, which brings me to, what number are we on? Number five, do identify the source you want it to use and the year. So the better way to ask the same question I'll come up here, hit this little pencil. We can go back to square one. Only reference the IRS site and it's for tax year 2024. So it says I need to reference the IRS guidelines for 2024. I'll only use the IRS website for this search. Now I'll focus on searching the IRS site to get clear guidance for this or that. Now this works as far as even giving it exact URLs. So oftentimes, like rather than downloading a file and uploading it to ChatGPT, I'll just point it to the website. Gave us a response down here and it looks like it pulled from publication 587 and topic 509. <laughs> That's not authoritative. I know, okay, I know, I know. But most of the research we do doesn't require a deep dive into code sections, okay? It's interesting, that's actually, like there's a question here of, well, what do I use my research tools for and what do I use this for? Increasingly, tools like ChatGPT, they're becoming great for more and more and more of research. But today there's definitely still a level of research where it is 
where it is super technical, where you may not agree with, say, the IRS's position on something, where at least someone in your firm still needs those tools to be able to do a really deep dive. But again, that's like a very small percentage of all of the research that you do, right? Number six, don't. Don't use custom GPTs. Sorry, gang, pour one out. I was super hot on custom GPTs in the past because the promise, it's great. You, you, you create basically a custom assistant. You say, here's the name, here's the description, here's the job it does. And so anytime it responds to you, it has all that context to say, I'm supposed to specifically do this. And then you can upload your own knowledge to it. So it only references the information that you give it. Cool, right? Wrong. The problem now is it only uses GPT-40. And if you remember, for accountants, like this is the model for creative stuff and this is the model for all the technical stuff. So if you wanna use a custom GPT for creative stuff, uh, knock yourself out. But for like research, for pulling from uh, an employee HR manual or something like that, oftentimes 4.0 will be good enough for that still. But I find myself just using chats, these standalone conversations, because I can't use the new models in custom GPTs, unfortunately. I hope that changes. In fact, we'll do a pinned comment below in 90 minutes when everything that I've delivered so far uh, gets changed in an announcement. Number seven, do, do use the desktop app. The desktop app is so, so good. And I find the thing that actually keeps people from using ChatGPT is they just forget about it. They forget about having to go out to this other thing. And so if you're an accountant and you have umpteen different monitors, proposal for you. You've been around the channel long. You know how I hate get rid of that email monitor. Do not let email just sit on a monitor distracting you all day long. That is such a waste. Your team chat, you're just asking for distractions. Twitter, be better than that. Might I humbly propose I don't know, a chat GPT monitor? Just saying, hot take, I don't know. I think it's a good idea. Now, a couple thoughts on implementation, how you actually use this in an organization. Number eight, don't reserve it for the big brains, for the, the top dogs in the firm. And this is the biggest issue with chat GPT adoption in accounting firms right now, is you get all the, all the smart people, the, the big guns in a room that normally make the big decisions, like if you're gonna go to a new practice management system or something like that. You get the big dogs in a room and they all, you know, they test chat GPT just a little bit and they're like, well, this isn't useful to me, so we're not gonna roll it out to the team. Meanwhile, you have an entire generation of kids coming through high school, coming through college, who are freaking wizards with chat GPT because it just did all their homework for them and they have an entirely different level of capability with those tools than you do, than the big dogs do. And right now I think ChatGPT is useful to anybody, but it is even more useful for the junior. I mean, how many basic trivial tax questions? Did you just spend so much time scouring books or control F searching PDF documents to get an answer to? There's like, I mean, we're worried about kind of the, is there critical thinking that's lost in the process of the research changing? In this case, eh, I'd probably say no, because you probably still want to check out the sources but it's a really fast way to get to answers. So don't let the big bosses block something that would actually be tremendously useful to the rest of your team. The resources juniors have at their disposal now that my gosh, would have been so valuable to me when I was in their shoes and not even just the early 20 somethings who came through school with it. Those people like, they're like the new version of iPad kids where you see them hustle an AI tool and you're like, yikes, that's, that is quite impressive but it's a tremendous resource for the junior folks, the staff level folks. So number nine, my do, my do is to put it into everybody's hands. And I can understand that might feel wasteful. What if they don't use it? I actually heard somebody the other day uh, propose like, try it on a use it or lose it sort of program. If people don't use it, okay, then you take it away and you, you, you kill that license, but the people who are using it, they get to lean into it. Now, Personally, I think this has risen to the level of something where everybody just kind of needs to be getting comfortable working with AI assistants because, boy, there's sure a whole lot of indicators uh, that seem to be pointing to this being the future, but it is a learned thing. Like, I mean, the biggest question is, what do you actually use it for? And the reality is the use cases are usually very nuanced. It's a specific client situation. It's this one-off fiddly annoying thing that you gotta do for a client. AI has not had like it's a uh, camera app on an iPhone sort of moment. And it's because kind of by design, it's meant to do sort of whatever you need it to do. And it certainly won't do everything, that's for sure. And what we can oftentimes get stuck on is the things it doesn't do. But what it doesn't do, it matters, but also doesn't matter. All I care about is what will it do? The things that it can do today, where it can save me a bunch of time, I wanna learn those use cases and I wanna lean into it. And, and tax research, frankly, right now, is a great example of that. This is a faster version of tax research for 80% of the things that I have to go and look up. 
Now, last one, number 10, don't, I think don't spring for deep research yet. If you've heard the news, OpenAI has launched this unbelievable tool called Deep Research that will spend upwards of 10 minutes producing, you know, a 10 page report on incredibly technical things. And we have real life PhDs coming out and saying, this paper is at the level that it would take a human PhD a week to develop. And it's doing it in, in, in 10 minutes. And this is not hyperbole, like across the board, people are saying it's incredibly impressive. Now, it can work with documentation that you give it. So like, is this the holy grail of, of tax research? Couple limitations right now. One, it's only available on the pro plan. The pro plan doesn't come with the same data protections as the team plan. But honestly, that may not be a big deal because in most client scenarios, the information that you're giving it can be devoid of any sort of client information, but something to look out for. And it is a bit of an annoyance. You can only get it on that pro plan. Hey, AI Jason from the future here. Great news. You can now get deep research on the chat GPT. Team plan. Wee! Woo, 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 woo. But also two, 10 pages. 10 pages is a lot. It's pretty rare that I, I have any problems big and complex enough to, to merit a 10 page response. If you go back to the very beginning, early days of ChatGPT, the thing that everybody said about it was, boy, it likes to talk. It won't stop. And it's gotten better, it's gotten more concise, and we've learned like, oh, you can tell it to be concise. But I can tell you, for most of the things that I do, getting a 10 page report back is gonna feel more like grading papers than doing research. Now, in, in I don't know, bigger firms, or if you have extremely technical uh, research projects, maybe it makes sense for you, in fact, I mean, it is worth probably plunking down 200 bucks and give it a try for a month, throw a couple things at it. And it's like, ah, man, if this would have saved me a few hours, then it's probably worth it. But what gets me more excited about deep research is this is the beginnings of more agentic AIs doing things over longer time horizons. This is the beginning of AIs reviewing a file. Imagine reviewing a set of financial statements with a given set of work papers. This is the beginning of AI reviewing a tax return, which is way harder than the financial statement example, in my opinion, because that is not just pulling correct information from documentation. It is, did it go into the forms in the right place? Like that's an astronomically complex thing to ask an AI to do, but this is the start of it. Like where you cut this thing loose and, and there really is no limit on how long you could cut an AI loose to work on something for you. Well, the limit would ultimately be your bank account. But when it comes to AI, like doing technical review or doing prep from end to end, this is what it's gonna look like. You're gonna cut it loose, it's gonna come back, you're still gonna have to review it, but we're probably not far from it being pretty darn good. Now, I'm not shaking in my boots about AI replacing my job yet, but the part of the accounting profession that has already been most impacted by AI, it is accounts payable and purchase order processing. And a company who's nailing it, this video sponsor, Makers Hub. You can, the music. Thank you. Why is AP being disrupted so much? Well, AI vision models are capable of pulling information off of documents better than OCR ever could have. I mean, it can even read like handwriting. So accuracy of what it captures off of documents is better than ever before. But when you combine that with large language models to do a bit of thinking on fringe scenarios where it's like, ah, does this make sense? Does that make sense? The result is we just took a giant step closer to like autonomous AP. And it's something that honestly, people have been promising us for like a decade plus. Finally, you don't need humans to enter this and that. And then one goes through and it picks up an extra zero and you're like, oh, okay. Maybe accounts payable is actually a very high stakes scenario to just let it go through. Now I can tell you personally, cause I worked with clients that have very complex accounts payable needs. We're doing receiving, managing inventory and all this stuff. We've done a couple demos on this channel of Maker Sub where you can see the tool in action. It, it would have eliminated uh, probably 80% of that work. And I've, I've genuinely talked with accountants. This is the only domain where I've talked to accountants who have said, yeah, AI like wiped out the accounting work that I do. Now, if there's a silver lining here, it is that uh, nobody's excited about AP and PO processing. Those same people are like, uh, they, they can have it, frankly, because I got other stuff that I would rather do. Now, when it comes to running a profitable AP service inside of your accounting firm, the flip side of this, for you, this is an opportunity to help usher this era in for your clients. It's an exciting time. And if you're doing that, check out Maker's Hub, link down in the video description. Now, you may have noticed, ChatGPT, it can be a little overwhelming right now. So let me show you 26 features that you and your team needs to know about to make sure you're getting everything out of it that you can.